The people of Northern California right now are in the midst of a quadruple crisis. Oh my goodness. Already they were in COVID, and then there's been a heat wave that's been crazy, and then wildfires, and then the threats of rolling power shut shortages, power shutdowns. Oh my goodness, you, I, I feel for them so much, and I hope you're praying for them, for the, all the people that are affected there. Just in the past two weeks, there have been over 13,000 lightning strikes recorded in Northern California. Oh my goodness, and of course, then all those start the fires and everything, over a million acres have burned so far. It's terrible. It's like an overwhelming tidal wave, but of fire. Firefighters are exhausted. Homeowners are anxious, and business owners anxious. Are the fire's gonna, is it going to come their way? Is it going to destroy their neighborhood? And life is turned upside down. And we may not have that kind of a physical fire right here in our area, but life kind of feels like that. It feels like life is turned upside down through the, this whole several months now of the pandemic. But then now, especially as we're turning the corner and kids are supposed to be going back to school, it just feels like everything is topsy-turvy. It, it feels overwhelming. It feels like a tidal wave of fire that we are walking through. On Sunday mornings, we have been walking through the Bible and looking at epic Bible stories, starting with the Old Testament and kind of emphasizing those. And we, I don't know if you've, been, if you've noticed this, but we've been going chronologically in order, looking at how God deals with his people, his chosen people, Israel. And as we, as we see God working in their lives, we learn about God's presence and God's power in our lives too. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, we've looked at several sort of periods of time or, or uh, seasons in the life of God's people. There was that whole slavery in Egypt, which lasted hundreds of years. And then the, the time of freedom and conquest of the promised land. There was the time of the judges. We specifically talked about Gideon, but there was other judges that God raised up, like Samson, the big strong guy. A lot of times people call me Samson. I, I don't know. I, I guess there's a resemblance, but... I don't know. I don't see it, but personally. Uh, then we talked about the era, the era or the season of the kings, and we talked about King Saul. Uh, we talked about David, didn't mention that he became the next king, and then wicked King Ahab. So we're, now we're kind of coming to the end of that season. Would you turn in your Bibles, if you've got it, to Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. If you've got it on a smartphone or tablet, that's great. And uh, we always use the NLT translation. Uh, uh, for, for reading publicly. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Tori and Joseph to come and bring some things for the kids. We've got activities, kids, to uh, just uh, give you something interesting to do with your hands that relates to today's Bible story. So I think you're going to enjoy that, and I hope it will make it even more meaningful for you today. So we're at the end of this season of life for God's people, uh, the end of the season of the king's. And you know how it is with, with kingship. We see it in certain European countries today and stuff. You know, there's the, the king and their, their child becomes the king or queen and then their child and their child. So that, that went for a long time and then God sort of brought it to an end uh, because there was a time of judgment for, for the people of Israel, for God's people. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of a neighboring country, Babylonia. And he came and he invaded the area around Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel. And he captured the best and brightest nobles and royals of Israel. So it would be sort of like an invading country coming in and taking Prince Charles and all those people, uh, 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 taking them captive and taking them off to their country. So, you know, it was a big, horrible deal. He deported them to Babylon. And they, there they were forced to learn the Babylonian culture and language and their ways for three years. And at the end of that three years, the King Nebuchadnezzar took the best and brightest of, the, of that group and he, he pressed them into service in uh, various areas of government of Babylonia. So you go from being in the ruling class in Israel to being taken sort of as a slave, as a captive, 
and taught all the ways, sort of indoctrinated, all that kind of stuff, and then, then they were pressed into uh, serv- government service in the new, in the new um, country, in Babylonia. This was the era of the exile. This was the exile. So we had the kings in Israel, but the kings, they're, no, they're not ruling anymore. They've been captured and deported. So now it's exile. God's people were taken away to a different land, to a different country. And I, I just can't even imagine what that would be like. I, I, I just think, you know, if I were taken from here and forced uh, to learn a different language, a different culture, and then forced to serve in that, like, I, I, I just don't know how stressful, how overwhelming that would feel. I love speaking Spanish, and I, I have, know just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> I, can, I can almost hold my way in a conversation, almost. And I've been practicing for a long time. And I still, I have a, I have a friend in Argentina that I, we, we call him, we do video chats. And he's practicing his English, I'm practicing my Spanish, and we both still have Google Translate up. Still just trying to get our ways through it. After years, and I, I just can't imagine just being, being dunked into a new culture and said, learn it, do it, and now serve, serve this country. Wow. So I'm going to pick up today's story in Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Okay, so, so just picture this. Not your normal statue. It would look a little bit more like the Washington Monument. Uh, Washington Monument's 555 feet tall, so it's a lot taller than this, but the same proportions uh, as this. So that, that's kind of what I would picture, only 90 feet tall. Now, the context is that this King Nebuchadnezzar, prior to this, in an earlier chapter of Daniel, we read, God had given this heathen king, this non-Jewish king, a vision describing all sort of the king, the big kingdoms of the world that were coming after him. And in his dream, King Nebuchadnezzar saw a statue made with different metals and different types of materials, a head of gold and so on and so on, and all the way down to feet of, of mixed with iron and clay. And it was a disturbing dream, and, and he couldn't figure out what it meant. God gave the, the interpretation to Daniel, the one who's, who's writing down this book of the Bible one of the Jewish exiles. And in this dream, uh, as God gave Daniel the interpretation, this is what Daniel said, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the gold statue. You are the greatest of all kings in this time period. And there are going to be other kings come after him. He began to interpret the dream. So then, King Nebuchadnezzar sets up a gold statue, and, he, and look at what he tells everyone to do. Verse 2. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. Okay, so this is an emperor, okay, King Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't just his little city-state like some of the other stories we've been reading about. He's an emperor. He's like, he, he just... Uh, uh, attached Israel to his empire. And so he's called everybody throughout the empire, all the leaders, come together to the dedication of this gold statue. Verse 3. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, and I think I've got a picture of that herald. Could we show that? (laughs) This is the unofficial town crier (laughs) in England. I, I learned as I just did a little research, he's not even an official. He's just a guy who shows up when princes are born and shouts, Hear ye! Hear ye! So this, this herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of all the musical instruments, the flutes, the trumpets, the accordions, the bagpipes, when you hear the sound of them, Bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Okay, whoa. Now hold on. You're a Jewish person who worships the living God, forced uh, away from your country, and, and you're here now among all these people, 
And this command comes forward, bow to the ground to worship this statue. Verse 6, anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And I don't know if we know exactly what this furnace would have been for. My sense is that it would have been a place to burn the garbage, burn the refuse of the town. So, you know, the biggest, hugest old furnace that they could get and they could make. Uh, Verse 7. So, at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Okay, so picture this. Thousands of people have gathered out on this plain, out on... on, uh, this flat, broad place, this huge statue, 90 feet gold statue up there. The, sound, the band plays. Oh, that was, that was my version of their music. Everyone bows, and they begin to say, I worship you, O statue. I worship you, King Nebuchadnezzar. You are God. You are our provider. You're our source of life. We love you. Can you imagine that? What a contrast to what we were doing earlier in the service here today. But, somebody say but. But. Mm -hmm. But there were three Jewish noblemen that were now Babylonian officials who did not bow to that idol. And you might have heard their names before, but do you know their names are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? That's their names. Those are their Jewish names that their parents gave them. And Hananiah means God has been gracious. Mishael means who is what God is. In other words, God alone is God. And Azariah means God has helped. That's what their names were communicating about their beliefs. Unfortunately, they're a little bit more well-known by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, some jealous officials in the Babylonian Empire ratted them out because these guys did not bow. And King, King Nebuchadnezzar, through the herald, had made it very, very clear, you bow when the music starts. And so they, when they, they, they ratted them out, they, they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, these guys don't bow. They don't listen to you, king. They don't respect you as king. These are those Jewish exiles that you thought were all trained up and all sold out to the Babylonian cause, and they didn't bow to you, king, to the statue that represents you. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage. So uh, not, not thinking rationally here at all, and he had the three, these three guys, these three Jewish guys brought in before him. And he said, in, uh, I'm going to give you one more chance to bow before this idol. And in Daniel uh, 3.15, it says, But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Verse 16 begins one of the most powerful speeches in the whole Bible, like in the whole Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Can you imagine being brought in before a tyrant who is in a rage? And he has all the power, it would seem. He has all the army, all the bodyguards. He has all the weapons. He has everything at his disposal. Can you imagine saying this? We do not need to defend ourselves before you, O king. Wow, why would they say that? Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God, the God, the one true God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And I love this little detail that they were still respectful. They respected authority. All authority comes from, is, is, is instituted by heaven. 
They, they respected that. But there is a higher authority. And if ever those two are in conflict, we go with God. He is the ultimate authority above every king, president, CDC director, and governor, and police officer, and mayor, and pastor. He is above us all. I put myself in there too. I too am a man under authority. Yes. So these guys, they're, they're full of faith. They believe in the one true God. And this is what they said. The God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. I love that. We could stop right there and it would be so powerful. Like, wow, to have the guts to stand up and say, we will not bow to this idol. We're not going to do it. God will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Never. We're, we are not doing that. That is a line. No. No. We are not going to cross that line. We learned your language. We learned your culture. We complied with all your regulations, but we are not crossing that line. We are not going to serve your gods. Not going to do it. We are not going to bow to your idol. I don't care what you do to us. Even if you throw us in a fiery furnace, I don't care. And then for them to say, our God will rescue us. That's the good statement of faith. Our God will rescue us. But to me, this next part is the most faith of all. But even if he doesn't. What do you do when God doesn't rescue you? Do you start saying stuff like, well, I don't know if God really is real. I don't know if God really cares about me. I don't know if he's even active in today's lives of men. Is that what you say? Or do you say, even if he doesn't heal me, I will serve the Lord. Even if he doesn't fill my bank account, I will serve the Lord. Because I don't serve him for things. I serve him because he is God, and I am not, and he is higher. And I bow my knee to him. Amen? And that's faith. It took a lot of faith to say he will rescue us, but it took more faith to say even if he doesn't, he is still God, and I'm not. I don't call the shots. He does. I live for him. I serve at the pleasure of the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. Amen. I do see a lesson here that sometimes there is a time to take a stand for Jesus. There is. And we are in those times right now. This is a time unlike any other, and we, we know that, not only because of the pandemic, but because of the internet. This is a time unlike any other. You have instant fame, you have instant arguments, instant debates uh, that, that carry ripple effects around the world. This is the time to stand up for Jesus. So you've got to think about what, what are the lines, though? What are the lines that are worth laying down your life for? Probably not most of the petty social media squabbles. Probably those are not the lines. But there comes a point where you say, I will not worship the gods of this culture. I will not. I will worship the living God. And I, I just have this sense that it's not about to get easier. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to break that to you. I'm kind of gearing up for what 2021 holds. It, it really depends on who is elected in our country at every level. Uh, I, and I, can, I can envision, I can imagine the, uh, it's just not too many steps from where we are. I can imagine a day when, you know, those Christians hmm, feel like they're not really helping society. We need to clamp down on them more. I can't imagine that. Uh, there was a day I couldn't imagine that. I can imagine that now. That's why it's so important that every Christian registers to vote, if you're not already registered, and that you vote. We, we do have, as Americans, we have that 
uh, that is the right way to protest. Rioting and burning down buildings, that is not the right way to protest. Voting, that's a great way to protest. That is a great way. Yes. If there is a conflict of wills, I quote Acts 5.29, Peter said, we must obey God rather than any human authority. If those two are in conflict, as we remember, all authority has been instituted by God, so we obey up to that point where it crosses a line in the Bible and in our, our, our serving of God. Okay, so the, these guys say that to King Nebuchadnezzar. His face was distorted with rage. What a picture. This is what he yells out. Heat the furnace seven times hotter than usual. And he ordered his special ops soldiers to tie up these three guys and throw them into the furnace. The flames were so hot, it killed the special ops soldiers. It killed them. They weren't even in the furnace. And they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Asherah, and Mishael into the furnace. Daniel 3.24 says, but suddenly, someone say suddenly. Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, probably the same ones who ratted these guys out, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. And literally in the original language, he said, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Jesus was there in the furnace with those three guys. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. And the fire had not touched them. The, the Bible says that not even a hair on their head, not even an eyelash or an eyebrow hair was singed. They did not smell of smoke. And I can tell you this is the opposite of the scene when I am barbecuing tri-tip. <laughs> it's a very fatty meat with flames just going all over. I am covered in the smell of smoke. All of my hairs on my arms, eyebrows are all twinged. These guys were in the barbecue, in the furnace, heated seven times hotter than usual, and they did not even smell like smoke. The bottom line of this message is this. Jesus is there for you when you're walking through fire. Jesus is there for you when you're walking through fire. One of my favorite verses uh, in the Bible is Isaiah 43, 2 and 3. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through fire, the NLT adds, of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. He doesn't say you're never going to walk through fire. Yikes. He doesn't say you're never going to go through a river of a difficulty. But he says, when you do, I will be with you. And I, I can think of at least two applications. I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch more. But number one, you might be walking through fire standing up for Jesus right now and in the days to come. Like when your boss threatens to fire you for offering to pray for a coworker uh, who, who was going through a hard time. Jesus is there for you. When you're mocked on social media because you honor authority or you speak up for the unborn, Jesus is there for you. When you don't participate in sinful behavior, even though everybody else is doing it, Jesus is there for you. And sometimes, good news, Jesus protects you from the pain. Ah, oh, so good. That's what happened in today's story. They were tossed into a, a flaming, fiery furnace, and Jesus protected them from harm. Sometimes, Jesus walks with you through the pain. I think of Stephen in the Bible, stories in Acts chapter 6 and 7, and it, he's the one that we named our son Stephen after. And he was there sharing his faith, talking about Jesus. 
in front of the Jewish high council. They drug him outside of the city, and as they were stoning him, God gave Stephen the ability, a vision, to look up and see into heaven. And there was Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne of God. And I just want to, I, I just, in my mind, I picture Jesus going like this. Stephen, come on up. I know they're stoning you right now, but I'm with you. You're not alone. You're doing what's right. Come on up. And the next thing he knew Stephen was there face to face with Jesus. Sometimes Jesus walks with you and keep, protects you from the pain. Sometimes he walks with you through the pain. And either way, Jesus is there for you. 1 Peter 4.14 says, If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you you will be blessed because God's spirit rests upon you. A second type of fire that I can imagine, you might be walking through fire trying to navigate through this pandemic. And you guys, I, I just want to tell you, parents, I am praying for you. I am praying for you. And kids, I am praying for you. This is pure craziness for you that's going on right now. You might be walking through other kinds of fire through the pandemic you're, when you're let go from your job and you don't know how you're going to make ends meet. Jesus is there for you. When you're being forced to work from home and simultaneously educate your kids and you've got to juggle your own Zoom calls and your three kids' Zoom calls every day, Jesus is there for you as you're walking through that fire. You might be feeling afraid that you're going to catch uh, the coronavirus. Jesus is there walking with you. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 says, He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Why don't you put your own name in these verses? He gives power to Elaine and strength to Scott. But those who trust in the Lord, when Garen trusts in the Lord, he will find new strength. Sarah will soar high on wings like eagles. Jan will run and not grow weary. David will walk and not faint. Put your own name in, there, in those Bible promises. Psalm 46, 1 to 2 says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. You may feel like you're walking through fire alone, but you're not. Jesus is there with you. He is continually by your side. There is no reason to be afraid. His rod and his staff protect and comfort you. Jesus is there for you when you're walking through fire. Kim Walker has a new album, Wild Heart, that's got, a, a, I love many songs on it, but this one song, Protector, really caught my ear. Uh, a couple words from this, this song. I come out of agreement with the lie that you've left me on my own. I am not alone. I, I don't agree with the lie that says, you're, by, you're on your own, God's left you. I don't agree with that lie. Protector, you said you wouldn't leave me, and you, you, you're right by my side. I know that you fight for me. You hide me in the shadow of your wings. Your presence is my peace, my covering. Jesus is there for you when you walk through fire. He's walking with you. If you've invited him into your life, would you stand to your feet in this room? I want to pray for you. And online, why don't you just uh, still yourself, calm the commotion, and let's pray. And let's take it to God. Lord, I thank you so much for your word that shows us that even in the worst fire, you are there with us. I thank you for that. I praise you, Lord. And I just want to ask you, stay in this attitude of prayer if you would. If you're going through fire, if you're going through it right now, can I just see your hand? And I, I want to just pray for you. I suspect there are many of you that feel like, yes, I am going through fire right now. If you've got kids, every parent I would think would have your hand raised right now because you're about to go through the fire if you're not already. But if, even for all of us online, I think it's cool just to raise your hand to God. And I want to pray for you right now. 
Lord, I thank you that if we invite you in, you're there. You're in our lives. You're in it for the long haul. You're in it when it gets tough. Even when we don't feel you, Lord, you are there. Even when it feels like we are literally walking through a tidal wave of fire, you are there. We can rely on you. And so, Lord, this morning, we just throw all of our eggs in your basket, Lord God. We just put all of our trust in you. And Lord, we ask you to take away the fire. We ask you, Lord, to take away the pain. And Lord God, we ask you to make it so our kids can go back to school, so we can go back to work and, and all those things, Lord God. We ask you to take away the sickness, the, the, the virus, Lord. We ask you for all those things. But even if you don't take away those things, even if it's not easy, we will bow to you. We will trust in you. We will walk with you through our fire, Lord God. And I pray for your strength, your resoluteness, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to your children right now like never before, Lord God, in Jesus' name. In the fire. Oh, come on, sing it. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Standing next to me, there is another in the water, holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding, power set me free. The grave that holds nobody, power lives in me, is another in the fire, standing next to me. There is another in the water, holding back the sea. Could I ever need reminding? How could you've been to me? I'll count the joy come every battle, because I know that's where you'll be. Come on, one more time. There is another in the fire, standing next to me is another in the water holding back the sea should i ever need remind how good how good you've been to me i'll oh, count the joy count the joy come every battle because i know that's where you'll be there is another in the fire oh there's another in the fire Oh, 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 there is another in the fire. Oh, 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 there is another in the fire. Oh, Jesus is there with you when you walk through the fire. Now, I, I want to talk to uh, some of you today that, that maybe you've never invited Jesus into your life to be with you. And you know what? He wants to come into your life. He wants to bring everything that you need to walk through the fire. And uh, I want to just invite you today to put your faith in Jesus, just like those guys did in the story. Put your faith in the God who saves. And so uh, I want to invite you not just to think about Jesus, not just to think he's a nice teacher or a good guy, but to actually invite him into your life and to become his apprentice, where you would actually follow him, uh, uh, imitate him, learn to love like him, learn to live like him, and experience the fullness of life from him. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin, turn your life over to God, and let him lead. Starts with just an invitation where you just invite Jesus in. Would you bow your heads with me one more time? And if, if today is your day, you would like to invite Jesus into your life, he will forgive your sins. He will make you new. He will change you. If you want to do that today, you want to become a Christian today or, or come back to God after wandering away, would you just raise your hand? And that will, that will be a signal to me in the room that I should pray for you. And online, again, I encourage you, just raise your hand to God. And uh, if today you would like to make that decision, would you just repeat after, after me? I, I want to just lead you in a prayer. So you repeat after me. Jesus... I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. 
I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, we welcome you to the family of God. And I just encourage you, we've been talking about the, the Connect card all day, whether you're in the room or online, if you just made that decision, would you fill out that Connect card and check the box that says, I made a decision to put my faith in Jesus today. That way I can encourage you, cheer you on, and pray for you. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. Isn't it so encouraging to know that we serve a God who is not only strong enough to lead us out of fire, sent seven times heated furnace to save us, to pluck us out and rescue us. But even if he chooses not to, even if for some reason in his great plan, it is better for us to go through that fire, we are not alone. Can I tell you the Lord is powerful enough, he is strong enough, he did not have to stand in that fire with them, but he did. He stayed by their side the entire time. And that is how he is with us. He is the same God yesterday, today, and he forever will be the same loving, saving, rescuing God. Isn't that good to know? That is good to know. Amen. Oh, man, you got me all caught up. <laughs> uh, so as you guys go throughout this week, we want to stay connected with you. We want to still be a part of your life. So throughout this week, if you could just go to our website, look at our app, follow along with our Bible plan. Let us know if you have any prayer requests. We would love to walk beside you in prayer just throughout the week. And for any kids in the room or any kids online, we have Kids Church Online. So you were already in the right place if you were watching us online. Just go to the Kids Church video. We have Kids Church videos for preschool and elementary age. They are awesome. I watch them often because, I don't know, I just like, they're encouraging. <laughs> Even I need them sometimes. So I just encourage you to go and watch those online. And if you are watching us online or if you are here, could you just like and subscribe to our, um, our YouTube channel? It just keeps you updated, keeps you in the know of what's happening when we post new videos. And for everyone here and online, I cannot wait to see you next week. Love you guys. <laughs>